Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to the webinar on Tuesday, the 14th of April. My name is Matthew Thompson, and today I'm going to be talking about how to get the most out of your CAM software. I'm going to be using Millbox as my CAM software. It's what I'm very familiar with, and many of you will be as well. Today, what we're going to be talking about in terms of topics is your CAM magic. Also, the requirements to get the most out of your CAM, some basics in terms of what you need to understand when you're going to mill a job, and then some tips and tricks as well. So, is your CAM magic? No, unfortunately, it's not. It's a computer algorithm. It's written by some very clever and experienced people in Italy, a company called Chim System, make Millbox and its predecessor, Sum3D. They are very excellent coders. Um, they know a huge amount about milling. They started off as a company making CAD software and CAM software for the industry, whether it be milling a block of titanium for aerospace or milling uh, glasses, spectacles frames. Um, that's what they started off doing and got really good at that. And then 10 to 15 years ago, they discovered they were good at doing dental as well. And now dental, <coughs> excuse me, takes over most of their business. So what is CAM software and what does it do? Well, it makes your life easier. You, you take a crown and you say, I want to mill this crown, and then the mill starts milling. But it's only as good as the information you give it. So if you put good information in, you're going to get good information out. Whereas if you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. So we've got to realize this is, it's not magic. It's only as good as the information we give it. So today we're going to talk about a lot about the information we give software to, to get the best result. It's also only as good as the user. I mean, I have this picture here of the Ferrari from Mercedes. It, it could be the best car in the world. It could be the best software in the world. But you, ne you need a skilled driver like Lewis Hamilton as a skilled driver. You, as the user of the CAM software, need to be skilled. You need to do the, the right series of processes in the right order and giving it the right information each time. Hence, knowledge is key and training is important. That's why we're doing webinars like this to ensure that everyone understands what the software needs as its inputs so it can give you the perfect output. So I'm talking about all this training. I'm not trying to scaremonger, um, but I just want everyone to be aware of, of what's involved. And so what, what's so hard? I mean, you are just you're putting a crown and putting it into a block and hit go. This cam part is at the end of the workflow. You've gone to all the effort of getting a, a good intraoral scan or a beautifully prepped die and a stone model, and you, you've scanned either of those. Then you've designed this amazing crown, which has the correct occlusion and all the right shapes and everything and you worked out that you're going to have a certain cutback for veneering all these things and now you're at the end of the workflow you can see the light at the end of the tunnel you just want to get it done but this is probably the most important part you, you can make the amazing design but if you can't manufacture it it's it's useless so it really is important to, to pay attention to the cam process to be ensure that to ensure that we are getting the result we want now CAM is ultimately a process done by a machine, computer-aided manufacturing. There's the computer and the manufacturing, and then the aid, with us in the middle, and also the computer aiding us. So it's a symbiotic relationship between man and machine. It is done by a machine, and the machine is only as good as you tell it to be. If you think of a, a Roland mill, such as the 52 DCI here, we've got a bunch of motors. One motor goes up and down, one goes left and right, one goes forward and back, and then two more tilt. And then, of course, there's the loaders on the side. If you strip this machine down, you could just get each motor and say, go, and it would move forward and back, forward and back, as you tell it. It's been arranged in, in such a situation that when you say go, it'll move around and, and cut out a crown. So it's only as clever as the information you give it. In the same way that a technician's value is in designing. You can pick up a handpiece, a wax knife, anything, any tool, but it's really only as good as the instructions that your arm gives to the wax knife. So we've got to think here about an uh, almost brainless piece of machinery doing what it's told, and we're telling it what to do. A lot like when a technician goes to, to TAFE to learn how to be a technician, there's an instructor, or maybe they're doing an internship, teaching them 
do this, do that. It's a, it's a learning process. So that's what we, we're talking about, it's, why it's so hard. It's not hard, it's just we need to be very careful and methodical about our processes. So let's look at some requirements then to ensure that we get a good result. We need a good computer. I've got a picture of some RAM up here and an old Intel Pentium chip from the 90s, looking at the size of it. Let's talk about CPUs then, and Intel, Intel Pentium is a type of CPU. CPU does a lot of the, the calculating in, in Millbox and SOM 3D. It's where it does all the processing of which milling step to do in which order. If I bring up my task manager onto the screen, I'm going to bring it across here just to, to show you. Let's look at the task manager in the performance tab. So the CPU, this is the, the computer, it's like the brain. You can see I've got an Intel i7 6700. This was a, a reasonably good CPU four years ago. And you can see there's, there's eight cores in, in HyperThread. And it's doing quite a bit of work here. And this is just running this webinar, running this PowerPoint. Obviously, when Millbox does a calculation, it's a bit more intensive, so it uses a lot more grunt. Whenever I do a calculation in Millbox, as we'll see later on, my CPU will, will nearly max out. So having a, a really good CPU is really going to help because that's where all the calculations are done. And typically, the higher the number, the better it is. Also, if you look at this 2.6 gigahertz number here, on the right side of the screen, that's the speed of the computer, how fast it is, how many calculations it can do a second. So having this as a high number up around three is really good as well. Contrasting the CPU with the GPU, which I'll bring up my GPU now, I've got an NVIDIA GTX 960. Again, this is a, a good card four years ago, but in 2020, you might want something gruntier. The GPU is like the eyes. It does everything with 3D and visualization. So when we're in Millbox, when we rotate the crown or rotate the block, the GPU gets used because that's the visual part of it. Whereas the, the CPU, the brain, does all the calculations. So you don't need an amazing GPU for Millbox. It's good to have a nice one, but it's much more important to have a really good CPU because that affects the speed of the calculation. Also, the SSD. So if we look at my disk here, we can see I've got a disk and it's not doing much thinking because the process I'm currently doing now doesn't require a huge amount of hard drive to be used. Using an SSD is preferable to an HDD, so a, a flash drive with no moving parts. It's just a bunch of glass and silicon acting as gates and you can write to that really quickly. Whereas an HDD or a spinning disk, imagine a record player, is a lot slower. So having an SSD, a terabyte is quite a nice size to have. That's really handy in order for the software to write all the information to the SSD really quickly, which again will speed up your process. And finally, the RAM. I've got eight, oh, sorry, 16 gigabytes of RAM here, and you can see I'm already using five of it, just running some simple processes on my computer now. We'll take a look later on what happens when I use Millbox, and we can see a lot more RAM gets used. I'd say in 2020, having 32 gigabytes of RAM would be an excellent starting point. So let's just move that off screen and we can bring it back in a few minutes. So ensuring we've got a really good PC to run Millbox efficiently is, is requirement number one. A little aside, some people like to have this on the same computer as their CAD software, whether it be 3Shape or ExoCAD or something else. That's a good idea often because if you've bought a computer good enough for scanning and good enough for CAD design, it'll certainly be good enough for CAM as well. However, if you're a high volume lab or clinic, then it might make sense to have one computer for the CAD and a separate computer for the CAM. Of course, you can run the CAD design software on your Millbox computer, but as a client, I wouldn't use it as your main design computer, but if you just need to maybe up a connector or change one or two things or go in and output the, the CAM file, the STL, then it could be worth having the design software on there too. But in an ideal world, having a dedicated CAM computer with a big grunty CPU, nice fast SSD and heaps of RAM, that's going to give you the result you'd like. So let's talk about more requirements and I've, I've used the same picture here of, of garbage in, garbage out. 
if we give the software the right information, we're going to get the result we want. So let's talk about workflow integrations here. Is your CAD software, your 3 shape or your XCAD, integrated with Millbox? Yes, it is, provided you have the right settings in the background. We always ensure that whenever we set up a, a new system or a, a new process with someone's software, whether it be 3 shape or XCAD, that we always have the right settings loaded. What we need there is some XML data and some maybe indication recognition stuff. I'm going to bring up a window here and I'm going to show you an example of a crown. So here we go, here's a crown, here's an STL file. Many of you will know STL file is the standard for almost all 3D softwares. We've also got a PTS file. PTS, unsurprisingly, is a condensation of points. If I open up this file in the 3D viewer, I can see that I have a collection of points in XYZ space. There's my XYZ axes and there's my collection of points. So having this information here is, is really, really handy. Or if you're using ExoCAD, get the construction info file. That's also crucial. What this also tells us is a series of points for the margin line and some other information as well. So having that, that information from your CAD software is going to make life so much easier in the CAM software. But what about if you've got a generic STL? Maybe someone has designed for you. Maybe you're using a design center or a, an outsource facility and they're sending you just the STL. This picture here on the left looks like a whole lot of gobbledygook, a bunch of random symbols. I've taken an STL and I've opened it up in Notepad. An STL is obviously a, an encrypted file. There's a bunch of symbols here that we as humans can't read, but you give this to a computer and it can interpret it into a crown or a bridge or whatever it may be. So whenever you get a generic STL from somewhere, always make sure that you're getting this extra information as well. Your PDS file, your XML data, your construction info file. So always ask for that. If you're getting someone to design your crowns for you, always ask for that. And we're going to look at this in a few minutes as well. So those are the, the basic requirements for getting a good result with CAM, having a good computer, and having it integrated with your CAM. So let's talk about some different indications. In Millbox, there's many different indications or families of indications, and we'll see some of these soon. The first family is the inlay or onlay or veneer. This is the simplest. It's just a shape. So I can just get my hand and make a shape here. This is just an organic shape or an organic blob. If we think about the way we do the milling of this, we'd start off with our blob and a block, and we do some roughing, do some finishing, and then we're done. That's the, the simplest way of doing a milling job. And if we look up the top right of screen, you can see I've got a picture here, and I've shown all the milling steps as well. But it really is just roughing, finishing, done. It's, it's really simple. And this inlay, onlay, veneer family of objects, all they care about is that it's a shape. The reason we do this is because inlays and onlays and veneers often have very thin, sharp edges. In this particular example here, it's got a, a fairly large side. It could be a maybe it's a, uh, the buckle or um, lingual side of this particular restoration, but you can see it's quite thick, whereas the other side isn't all the way over. So this would be a, a case where it's really thin at the edge. Having this really thin edge, it's important to mill this delicately, but also just it is just an organic blob. So that's one way of approaching it. Just go rough, finish, done. What about other indications? Crowns, bridges as well, fall into the same family as crowns. They're a bit more advanced. They have a special margin line and a, and a cavity as well. If we look at this picture on the bottom right here, you can see the dotted lines from my PTS file go all the way around the margin line. And you can see I've made this transparent so you can see the cavity. When we look at the milling steps, it does rough and finish, but it also does a specific step just for the margin line. It's called the prep line step, and it goes around really slowly, clockwise, and slowly works its way in across the width of the margin line. So we're talking 150, 200 microns, whatever you set your width to be. So it does roughing and finishing, but it also has this special step for the margin line and the cavity. 
What the PTS also tells us is the orientation of that particular crown. So if I've got a crown like this, I can orient it this way or that way or however way I wish to rotate it. When you have the PTS file, Millbox will look at that, get the information for the direction and rotate that perfectly vertical. So having this PTS is really good, not just for the margin line, but ensuring that the crown is rotated to the correct orientation vertically to ensure the tool gets in and mills everything out. You don't want any undercuts or milling uh, areas that aren't quite done in the cavity because then your crown won't fit onto your die or your prep. So having this PTS or construction info file is really, really important. Hence I put it in red and some pictures here to show you as well. So I'm really hammering home. Make sure you get the PTS, make sure you get the construction info file because it'll make Millbox's job so much easier. Good information in, good information out. Some other different indications we have in Millbox as well is anything with a, a screw access hole. So this could be an abutment, just a, a single abutment maybe, or it could be a bar with five or six, or it could be a hybrid. We'll get to hybrids shortly. But what it depends on is the interface. So you're going to be drilling a hole for the screw access, but you may also be drilling a hole for the screw seating, or you may be drilling a hole for the internal or external interface. In this picture down the bottom left here, you can see that looks like it's an internal interface with a hexagon. This is um, obviously an internal interface and it's got some flat sides. I've put here in bullet point organic. So this hexa hexagon shape isn't organic. It is not organic. It's very straight, and rigid. Whenever we mill something like this, we want to do an abutment because it's, it'll be for an abutment, it's direct to fixture. So this is, this is not organic and we're going to mill it as the abutment family or maybe you've got a multi-unit for a, a bar. You're not going to have a, a regular straight interface there. You might have a nice cone. This again is not organic. It's not, a perfect cone is never organic. It's a very regular shape. So for that, we're going to use a bar interface as well. So we've got our families of internal or external interfaces that are either abutments or bars that are not organic or everything else that is organic, say it's being cemented onto a tie base, that is when we use a hybrid family. The difference between them is whether we mill or drill out those particular interfaces. So you can imagine for a cone, you can drill it, whereas an organic interface, you may have to mill it because it's got some, some funny shapes. So enough slides. Let's have a live demo. So I'm just going to open up Millbox on my computer here. I'm using the, the DG shaped version. So if you've got a roller milling machine, this is a, a flavor or a version of Millbox that's just for the, the Roland milling machines. So all the dry milling machines loaded. And we're going to have a look at some of these. So you can see here the interface is quite simple. We've got some options on the left side of screen, job management. Say I wanted to open up a job I did a few weeks ago, for example, I could load one of those. Or I can go into tools and there's a bunch of tools that we'll look at very shortly. But to start a new job that we're gonna do now, we're gonna go to the top right of screen. And we're gonna click on new job. You can see here I've got the 52 DCI loaded and I'm gonna choose some, some PMMA. We've got a particular fixture. I'm going to choose that particular fixture there and click the green tick. Now it's going to automatically prompt me to import an STL. Let's look at Crown ExoCAD, for example. So I've got a crown here from ExoCAD. I can single click on it. I've got a preview. I can click on this preview. And I can bring up a three dimensional view of my crown. You can see here I've got some quite detailed anatomy in there. But a nice smooth cavity and there we've got our margin line as well. It's telling me the, the height of that particular restoration which can give me a hint for which block I'm going to use. As we spoke about before for something like this it's in the crown family because it's got a nice organic margin line. For that I'm going to choose full contour crown. We click the green tick again and it loads that particular crown into the workspace. I'm going to quickly choose a block. I'm just going to use a, a 10 millimeter for example sake. 
and I'm going to say webinar, and what's the date? 14th, 4th, 20 for my lock code. And you can see it's taken this crown, imported it, added some sprues, and placed it in the block. So let's have a quick look here. What we can see here is this bright pink line. So that is the inner margin line and the outer margin line as well. So you can see here, it's taken the construction info file for my Exocave crown, and it's read in all the points that define this margin line, and it's drawn this pink line around for us. And that way we as a human can look at this and say, aha, yep, it's got the margin line for me. This is gonna mill well. It's gonna do roughing and finishing, but it's gonna do a special step just for my margin line. Nice and slow to ensure I get a really good result. I don't get any chipping or any failures. So that's step one, is making sure that we've got a nice pink margin line. We also see here that the cavity has been covered by this gray cap. This gray cap is really important because again, it tells us as a human visually that it's detected the cavity as an independent part of the crown as a so to a, an organic shape. We can show and hide these if we, we don't like to see them. We can just go to tools, go hide and hide cavity. So I can show it, I can hide it, whichever I choose. I personally like to always show it, that way I know it's there, I know it's detected it, and I know that I'm going to get a good milling result. So that's step one, is always check that you've got your margin line and your grey cavity. Step two is sprues. Now one of the things we put on this webinar, the blurb online, was correct sprueing. There's a lot of uh, ways you can think about sprueing. You can have some big fat sprues, maybe one or two of them to hold it in. You can have four really small ones. Normally, we go with three in a triangular setup, 120 degrees apart. You can see here that some sprues have been automatically placed for me. And they're 120 degrees apart. And they're at the widest point of the crown. So maybe I can click on this blue left one here, and we can see there's this white line running around the outer part of the crown, the widest point on the crown. So this is a really handy algorithm that runs in the software showing us where we should put the sprues. Normally you want it on the widest point so you don't have any undercuts. Let's maybe put it somewhere silly. So let's click it and we'll drag it to somewhere where it's not on the white line. And we can see immediately that we're going to get a blue undercut here. This is because if we look from the side, we imagine we're the milling tool coming from below, it can't reach in this undercut area here. So when it comes to sprueing, make use of this white line, which goes around the outer edge of your crown, so you can see the best place to put your sprue. When it comes to how many I should do, we saw before that 120 degrees apart was quite a good way of doing it. I've moved that, so let's put it back to 120 degrees. What's another way of doing it? Maybe I want to delete that one and take this other one here, swing it around so they're 180 degrees apart. Maybe I want to make them a bit bigger so I can move these sliders and make them three millimeters. Same with this one here, really big, really big. That's another option as well, but just be aware that if you make it too big, it might start to overlap onto your anatomical surface, your occlusal surface, where you've got all this detail, you've gone to all this effort to design this beautiful crown, but if you do this, it might interfere with that. Or if we do it slightly too low, it's going to interfere with the margin line. We don't want that either. So we've got two options. One is make it smaller, or another one is change the pin type from non-cuttable to semi-cuttable or cuttable. Looking at the picture for semi-cuttable, what that does is it takes the sprue, so I'm gonna use my arm as the sprue here, and it does a little cut halfway through. But it only cuts it off halfway, hence semi-cuttable. The idea there is that you can come in and with your thumb, push the crown and it'll pop out after being milled. And that's red. Whereas green, 
The other option here is fully cuttable. What happens there is after it's done the milling job, it'll come back and it'll completely cut the sprue off and it'll give us our anatomy or maybe our margin line back. It's not so good if you're wanting to try and recover anatomy or margin line, but maybe you have a big bridge that you want to sprue up, and maybe you've got a, a sprue on the, the facial aspect of a central incisor or something. You can use it to come back and clean that up afterwards. So a few options when it comes to sprueing. Or we could maybe make it square in shape. Let's have a look at that there. So you can see here, this one's it's really wide, but not as tall. So you're getting a good surface area. It's, it's wide and not very tall, but it's a, a huge amount of surface area, which allows you to really hold on to that crown quite well. So that's another option as well, is to have these square shaped sprues. And you can see the, the morphology here matches the shape of your crown really well. So that's another option, is having nice square shaped sprues. And again, I can click on this, can change the height if I want, change the width if I want, and play around to your heart's content. But generally, for a crown like this, I'd normally go with two fat, really big sprues 180 degrees apart, or three smaller ones at 120 degrees, just like we had at the start. The beautiful thing about Millbox is I've got this undo button on the left side of the screen here, and I can just keep clicking undo, going back through all the steps to how it was. So I can say, oh, maybe I didn't like that. And there we go, back to the defaults. Of course, once you figure out what you like for certain restorations, so for all single unit crowns, you might want to have it like this. For all bridges, you might like to have it another way. You can change the settings. I'm going to quickly show you some of those abilities to change the settings. So if I go to a uh, new job here, very quickly. And just close that. You can see down the bottom right of screen here, we've got configuration. If we go there, and you'll only have this in the newer versions of Millbox. If you've got an old 2017 version, you might not have this. We can go in the preferences and configuration down to supports. And I can say for all full contour crowns made of PMMA, I want to have certain types. I want to have rectangular shapes. I want to have certain widths, or I want to have uh, different diameters, a different number of crowns. You, you can have cuttable, semi-cuttable, assign a single support as cuttable. Lots of options here that you can play around with. So have a bit of a think about what you want to do with your particular jobs, whether it's aesthetic, whether you want to move the crowns to certain places, or whether you want to avoid maybe the mesial and distal contacts. Speaking of mesial and distal contacts, there's a really cool feature that's come out in three shape just in the past few years, where say we've got a zirconia crown that we're milling in. Uh, let's, do, no, let's, do, let's do wax, let's do wax. Say you've got a wax crown that you're milling and you've gone to a, a huge amount of effort to design this particular crown to have really nice contacts. Maybe you're gonna press this wax crown, these really beautiful contacts. You don't want to have them cut away what we can do is we can make use of another feature that comes with uh, three shape, not just the PTS for the uh, margin, but the PTS for the contact areas. So if I open up this particular PTS in my viewer, we can see that there's all these contact areas. This might not be so easy to see over the, the resolution of the webinar, but what we've got here is one mesial and one distal, and then a bunch of occlusal contact areas. If I quickly open my crown up at the same time, you'll see these overlay. Maybe if I hide these, it'll make more sense. So you can see we've got one mesial or distal contact there. You can just see the dots and another. Let's go and load this one into Millbox and we'll see how that looks. So again, we'll choose a, a full contour crown. This is gonna load in, it's gonna take our PTS, that defines our margin line, set our orientation correct, cover it with a gray cap, then it's gonna take the next PTS file, which is our contact areas, and it's gonna show us where it will not put sprues. So here we go. You can see here, someone's gone to a lot of effort to design this with a desired mesial or distal contact. There's some occlusal contacts here as well. 
Swing it around, there's another one, and you can see here there's a bit of an undercut in there. It's been deliberately designed like this. We've gone to all the effort of designing. Let's make sure that our contacts are loaded. So again, this is something we can help you with in, in three shape if you want to utilize this option. I'm going to quickly load it into a blank. Let's just choose a 12 millimeter. I won't bother giving it a name for example's sake. And now let's go home. And let's have a look. And what we can see here is that it's automatically placed the sprues at 120 degrees apart, but it's set up. One of these sprues is interfering with my contact area, and we can see it's flashing yellow. So it's a really clever piece of software here. If I click on the sprue, I move it away, it goes blue. It's perfect. If I move it into the contact area, it flashes yellow at me. It's got a problem. Same if I move it up here into that particular contact area. It flashes yellow. Move it down, it's blue. So having this information here is really, really handy and ensures you get the milled result you desire. So making use of this PTS file is going to make your life a lot easier. Again, if someone is designing for you and you're milling for them, make sure you always get the PTS or the construction info file to ensure you always get all the information you need to ensure a good milling result. Cool. So let's quickly jump back to this margin line here and let's have a think about what if maybe I didn't get the PTS, what could I do? You can manually load it. The software is clever enough. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to quickly go to curves and surfaces and I'm going to delete that particular cavity. Delete that margin line and now it's just a generic shape. We can see here it's a it's a crown. You and I, as people in the dental industry, look at this and see it as a crown, whereas the software just sees it like an inlay or an onlay. It's just an organic shaped blob. But we want to make sure that this, this beautiful margin line we've got here, we've gone to all the effort of designing it, making it the right thickness, it's milled correctly. So what can we do? We can go to tools, we can go to curves and surfaces, and we can go margin line detection. So the software has a little algorithm. You click on this, we give it a hint. So again, good information in, good information out. I give it a hint saying the margin line is here. There's my black dot, I've got a width. Maybe I want 0.2 as my width or 0.3. Let's go with 0.15. I click the tick and you can see the green bar across the top quickly processes. An algorithm is running through and oh look at that, done in two or three seconds. It's gone around the edge, looked at the algorithm, found that that margin line, found the point, marked it around with our two pink lines and covered our cavity. So if you ever see your crown comes in and it doesn't have this here, go to tools, curves and surfaces and choose margin line detection. And that way you can be assured that you've got all the information you need. Excellent. So that's some, some basic tips and tricks for just a generic crown. Let's talk about now, we'll take a small diversion into maybe a multicolored block. Maybe wax isn't the best idea for this, so let's go back to our previous job from before, PMMA. And maybe I've got a multicolored PMMA or a multi-shaded PMMA block that I want to use. This is a generic color here. Let's look and see if I've got any loaded. No, I don't. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and create ourselves, and you can do this too, a multi-layered block. So on the keyboard, I'm going to go Control D, and you can see it loads up the configuration menu and our blocks. You can see we've got a huge number of blocks here. So I'm going to sort by material code, and I'm going to go and find my PMMA. So we'll scroll down until we find PMMA. Here's PMMA. There's a bunch there. Let's look at this one here. We can see it's 98 by 10, and I'm going to copy this one. Rather than creating it new, there's a lot of fields to fill out. Let's just take one which is 98% of the, the way there. Sorry, excuse the pun, 98 millimeters. We'll say copy. And we can see we've got our example here. I'm going to call the producer of this uh, webinar. And I'll give it, a, give it a name. We'll say April Tuesday, for example. I've got a size. Let's make this 11 millimeters, just to be different. All the, all the other information is preloaded, and we can see we've got this button here for multi-shade. So 
I'm going to tick this little box here, and then we can see I've got my multi shade. At the moment, there's only two shades to find. So I'm going to click on this, and let's say we want four shades because it's the fourth month of the year. And height. So we can see we've got a blank height of 11. Let's do the first one has a height of four. The next one has a height of three. The next one after that has a height of three. And the last one has a height of one. Maybe we change that from four to three. So we've got three, 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 and two. So it's important to know what you're defining here is the height of each section. So my first height is three millimeters tall, but a shade of white. I can click on this shade here and I can go choose a blue. Let's choose this particular blue here. The next one I can choose green. Next one I can choose a yellow, for example. And the last one I can choose a red. Now, I've never seen a block that color before in real life, but what we can do here is know that if you've got certain shade gradients throughout your block, or maybe you've got a two colored block, it's nice to have these as distinct colors. It may look a bit silly, but it's very helpful so you can know, ah, my incisal edge, I want to put up in the blue section to get a certain coloring or translucent, or not necessarily translucency, but shade. We can nuance to next, so you can see it sort of does this gradient rather than a step change. Maybe you want to have that. Maybe we want to have the top quite uh, distinct change, but the rest is a gradient. So let's say OK, OK, and then we're going to save. We just have to restart the software once just to be sure that we've got all the blocks loaded. If you're going to go to the effort of doing this, you might as well do lots of blocks. You can put in whichever brands of blocks you've got. Maybe you've got a, a certain new block of PMMA with a certain shade that you want to load in three different heights or four different shades, do all of them at the same time. And again, remember, control D, then find a block, which is almost what you need, copy it, and make the changes. So I'm going to jump back here, find my job from before, my PMMA. And I'm going to go to blank and put my blank, and there we go. We've got my product name, April Tuesday, and we've got my disc with this wonderful bright red color and it's 11 millimeters high. I'm going to click plus to make a new one. What's my blank name? Let's call this 1040 AM. And the lock code can just be a random set of numbers and letters. Do I want to nest? Yes, I do. So we can see it's taken my crown and nested it into this block. And you can see we've got our coloring. So maybe you want these incisal edges, all these cusps to be a certain color, and you can see the rest of it is nuanced. If I want to look exactly from the side, I can I can play around with my mouse. Oh, I'm nearly there. I'm nearly there. It's Sometimes it's not so easy. Another really helpful tip and trick is to use the F buttons on the keyboard. So F5, F6, F7, and F8. F5 looks from above. And if, whichever view you're currently in, it just goes above. Same with F6. Is from one side, F7 is 90 degrees around, so we can see it spins, and then F8 is another view as well. So maybe you want to use the, the multicolor function of the block. Maybe you want to look from F7, and that way you can use this arrow which goes up and down to ensure that you're going to get the incisal edges or the cusp exactly within this as you like. Or maybe you're seeing that it's the, the PTS was designed on a certain angle, but maybe you want to rotate it. You can use your yellow rotational button there to ensure that you've got all the, the cusps there into the blue for that shade at the top. So there's another really helpful tip and trick is to use the F buttons on the keyboard. F5 for above, F6 and 7 for the sides, and F8 will give you a three-quarter view. F9 flips it over. So maybe you're looking at the occlusal side, you don't want to go to the effort of spinning it around, oh, where's the underside? Oh, I've lost it. What you can do is go, maybe go F8 and then F9. So it just flips it over on the A-axis, as if you were flipping the, the puck over in the machine. So there it might be a really helpful tool as well. You've got it on a certain view, but you go, ah, keep that view, just flip it over for me, F9. So F5 through F9 are some really helpful shortcut keys to use. I find F5 is really good for when I'm setting up the sprues. That way I can know, okay, are they 120 degrees apart? Or maybe, maybe they're too close. Maybe my tool will never be able to get down into there. That's really helpful to do. Whereas F8 might be a better view for placing the sprues on the wall 
from this F8 view, I can see where they are up and down, but I can also see left to right as well. I could do this with maybe F7 or F6, but all I can see here, all I can see is the up and down. I can't see in and out of the screen. So F8 is a really handy um, shortcut key, so you can get a really good idea of where you're going to put the sprue on this particular crown. So those are some really handy tips and tricks. The F buttons and using a multi shaded block all at the same time to get a, a really good milling result. So we've spoken about the basics of a margin line for a crown. We looked at some cool tips and tricks. One thing I want to get onto is hybrid abutments or screw retained crowns. So let's do a new job. Let's, for example, do the conia. Oh, no, let's do PMMA again. I quite like PMMA. I'm going to say yes, we're going to do this new job. Now I'm going to go and do my hybrid example. I'm going to click on this here. You can see this is one I threw together before. It's uh, a Strauman interface for those of you who know all your tie bases off by heart. I've just done a generic cylindrical shape for this. We don't really care about the anatomy detail here. What we care about is this cemented interface. So what's the difference between a crown and a hybrid? Obviously, there's a drill hole and an interface. Now, this interface here is conical. And as I was saying before with the slides, if you've got a perfectly conical shape, that's not organic. It's very defined. So that would be an abutment. But this one isn't just conical. It's also got these other bits here, these little notches for anti-rotation that Straumann used. And they are more organic. If you look at some of the other tie base shapes you might have, an ELOS or an NT trading or all the other different shapes, they have different anatomies on the inside for their cementation. So because we've got an organic shape with a screw hole, we choose hybrid abutment. That's the rule. If you ever get confused about what am I doing, what should I choose this as, I'm, I'm, it's an implant of some kind, if it's got a screw hole and if it's being cemented with an organic interface, it is a hybrid. That's the rule. Stick to that rule and you'll have success. Let's choose an arbitrary 10 millimeter block here. And you can see here it's gone and put on some nice square shaped sprues. I think square shaped sprues are really good for this particular round cylindrical object here because they give us a nice strong support and they're a good distance apart to get the tall one. But that's not what we're worrying about. I'm just going to hide these, sorry, delete these sprues now. And we're going to talk about the difference between. Oops, sorry, I've lost it. If you ever get lost, top left of the screen is the home button. Click that there, it'll go back to the top. So let's look from the side and let's look at our hybrid abutment. So we spoke before about having a margin line defined by some pink lines and our gray cat. That's exactly what we want. But as we know, this is a hybrid abutment. It's not just cavity, it's also a drill hole. So if I push number nine on the keyboard, it goes transparent. And we can see here, we've got our interface and we've got our screw hole. In the 2019 and onwards versions of Millbox, this uh, drill, screw drill hole is defined by a bright green line. In older versions, maybe you've got an older version of some 3 d it's a pink line, but in the new one, we've got a green line. This is a really good visual indicator to show us where the drilling is and where the milling is. Obviously, the, the screw axis hole will be drilled, like if you drill a hole in a wall, whereas the interface will be milled out. You can also see at each end of the drill hole, we've got a, two red caps. So whenever you think of a, a drill hole in mill box, it's always going to have a green line that has a length, a width, and a direction, and then two red caps. When I say a length and a width, if I go to tools, Curves and surfaces, change cylinder size, and then I can see it hides everything apart from my bright lime green drill holes. I can click on that one, and you can see it's got a width and a length. I can maybe make this slightly wider. I can make this three millimeters if I want. 
you can actually see here it's gone and made it slightly wider. You can see that green. Maybe I make it 3.5 for argument's sake. It makes it even wider. Or I can go down to say 2.5. You can see it's made it smaller. So this is a really handy visual tool. If you're going to be drilling holes in objects, which you will for any screw retained crown, just go in here and double check that it's got the right sized hole. Almost always with a Roland, you're going to be drilling holes with two millimeter drill bits. But what if your drill hole is 2.2? That's a very tight hole for your two millimeter drill bit to go into. It could be worth going in here and just pushing this out to be 2.8 instead, or, or something slightly bigger than the than the hole than the tool, sorry, to ensure that you get a really good drilling result. So that's a function there you can do. You can change the cylinder size. Again, if I push zero. Going to make the object opaque again so number nine is transparent zero is opaque so switching between these to double check that whenever you load in a hybrid abutment you've got your bright green line to signify your drill hole you've got a red cap at each end to mark the edges of the drill hole that's a really good way to ensure that you've got what you need to successfully mill out this hybrid abutment Let's again assume that you got this from a design center or a colleague or someone that didn't give you the XML information or the PTS, all that other information. So I'm just going to quickly delete those. I'm going to go curves and surfaces, delete, click on the red, click on the green, click on the red, and it's gone. So we can see here that we've got the interface is good, the margin line is good. However, our drill hole is not. What do we need to do to ensure we get a correct drill hole here? We've got our button, add capture cylinder and cylinders detection. So I'm going to click on cylinders detection and I'm going to click somewhere in the wall of the cylinder. Now this is a lovely example because it's perfectly straight and it's even. Sometimes say you've got a, a central incisor with an angulated screw channel and it's different lengths on the hole, maybe because of the, the curvature of the, the uh, palatal aspect of the central incisor. You want to click somewhere where you can definitely see all of the cylinder. So I click that, it looks for an algorithm, and there we go, it's detected our cylinder. It's our length and our width that we desire. Next, we have to go add cap to cylinder. Again, click somewhere on the cylinder, and bang. Here we go, we have our hybrid abutment defined perfectly. We've got a green drill hole, some red caps at either end, and we've got a gray cap covering the cavity and a bright pink line for our margin. So that's a really, really handy tip or trick to ensure that you get the perfect result when milling out a hybrid abutment. So what have we covered? We've covered what we need to think about when we're doing milling with CAM. We need to get a nice grunty computer. We need to give it good information, which is almost always a PTS or XML from 3Shape or a construction info from Exocad. We can load these into our millbox really easily. We can make any shape or height of disk we want. Sorry, color as well, the multi shade blocks. We can also put the sprues how we wish. So let's quickly look at that again. I can click on the object. I can go the, the green plus up here. I can add a sprue and add a sprue. So that's really easy. Again, I can change them to cylindrical if I want. I can add a cylindrical one there, change the color to be semi cuttable, non cuttable. So those are some tips and tricks when setting up your sprues. Again, F5 will always show you from above. F6 and F7 will show you the two sideways views. F8 will show you a three-quarter view, and F9 will flip it over for you. And we know how to define the drilling axis for a hybrid abutment. Those are probably the, the five key things that will give you success for Millbox. As long as you do those easy things right, you'll get a really, really good result. Of course, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. The support team are all very well versed in Millbox. We know how to use the software really well. We know all the other tips and tricks as well. So that's the end of our live demo. If you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. We've got social media, we've got LinkedIn, all the different avenues for contacting us, or you can sign up for our newsletters. We will post uh, more information about other tips and tricks like this, other upcoming webinars we've got, and other information too. Awesome. Have a good day. Thank you very much.